Good morning, Rotary. Good morning. Glad everybody's attention. Our invocation uh, announcer, let them get them sit out. We're going to start a little early this morning because we got a lot to fit in. So when Eric is ready, We'll have the, uh, <laughs> hey, I'll, I'll let you walk around the line before I said anything. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, if you would please stand with me, I think it's too fitting that we just take a moment of silence before we get started to remember those that are in uh, Houston, Texas, right now in the surrounding areas, if you will. God, please you untie the knots that are in our minds, in our hearts, and in our life. Remove the not the have nots, that the can nots, and the do nots that we have that are taking over our minds. Erase all the will nots, the may nots, the might nots that may find a home in our heart. Release from us the could nots and the would nots and the should nots that obstruct our life. And most of all, dear God, we ask that you remove from our mind, our heart, and our life all of the am nots that we have allowed to hold us back, especially the thought that we are not good enough. Thank you. The pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Sign out Genius this afternoon. We'd love to have anybody there in it, but uh, I'd like to pick up track. Awesome. Chip? I got one. I got one. All right, it's that time again, guys and girls. It has cooled off a little bit. It's not 90 degrees anymore, but Gate City Rotary is still smoking hot. All right? That's a hunk of hunk of burning rub official t shirt for anybody on the team. How many people have one of these already? All right, we got a good show of hands. We need more people. This year we're going to cook eight different entrees and enter them, okay, so we can win the grand champions. Chris has got chicken covered. I'm pretty sure I have a Boston Butts and maybe something else covered. Steve's got desserts. That leaves about four or five things that we got to cover, guys and girls. 
We're going to need some help. There's chili, I, and there's ribs, there's several other things. So we're going to have to form a team. And uh, anybody who's interested, if you would email me or hang around after the meeting today, we've got a little organizational thing. Our first cook, first practice cook, and believe me, it takes practice to get this done because of the way we do it. Um, uh, September the 10th, that's a Sunday, uh, and then our official, and Kelly and I were going to get together today and set the day, but actually what I did was I checked with the person who's really in charge, <laughs> and she says we're having the second cook on October the 8th, which is a Sunday, it's an away game for the Panthers, so we don't have that conflict, uh, we'll cook 40 pounds of barbecue that day, that's enough to feed 80 people, we'll cook a whole cooker full of chicken, we'll try all the other things that we can, and uh, that we're cooking for the thing will be like a dress rehearsal. And it's a fundraiser for Rugby. It's called the World's Greatest Meal. And we'll ask everybody to kick in. We haven't figured out how much, but we'll ask everybody to kick in some donation uh, to the World's Greatest Meal. So that's uh, October 8th. Please put that on your calendar. And the only way to get one of these is join the team. So come on. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Awesome event. Also, um, I've had a couple calls about the disasters that were going through down in uh, uh, Texas and Houston. And did everybody get my email last night from the district? Uh, Boyd uh, D. Navarro sent out a, uh, an address. It's the, our High Point office that you can, you can send checks. And you can do it on your own, or we can. I've, talked, I've thought about uh, just everybody will take a collection next week, and the club will send a check. All right, I'll put a reminder out for that. Make it out to the foundation? Yes, D-A-E-F. All right, and uh, I'll make another announcement in email. All right. Um, all right, quick round of uh, Rotary Feud. Come on. Okay. Why so silent? Buster, why so silent? All right, we got a Buster group. I like big tables, so Mid, uh, you raise your hand, I don't think this. All right, Mid, do you want to uh, accept or pass? What's the subject? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's seven answers. That's what I can tell you. Okay, you're accept. All right. But guys, listen up. Name a cartoon tune movie that makes you cry even as an adult. Name a cartoon, a cartoon movie that makes you cry even as a kid. You cry as a kid, you cry as a kid. You probably cry more as an adult. I think that's probably got to be on there. Number one, ding, ding, ding. Come on, seven. I'm going to have to like three years. If you were to pass, and then with a guy, it's amazing. Why do you want to pass? <laughs> Pass is an X. Okay, let's pick up another one. He said thanks. Excellent guess. And uh, yeah, what's the cartoon? Good guess. But, and X number two. And number three. Great guesses. I want to give you a chance on your birthday. For your birthday. Why are you guys? Yeah. There you go. Uh, Toy Story. Number two was Lion King, number three was Cinderella, four was Fox and the Hound, five was Finding Nemo, six Beauty and the Beast, and seven Dumbo. Happy dollars. Happy dollars. Oh God. I know we got it. Everybody's always so, you know, they sit there and then all of a sudden at the end they realize, <laughs> 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 
I wasn't even thinking about happy dollars when I left the house today until I started talking to Chip Vale. And I had the most unusual experience. Oh, yeah, yeah. How are you? Made out to be. I had, I, I'm in the process of buying a home in the historic area, and it's the picture up of hell. I mean, really, really bad. And I know that I've got, I've got everything going against me to start out with. So I go down to the uh, city hall yesterday, ready to fight. I went to three different departments. I had never been treated so. It was, it was amazing. I mean, people just bent over backwards. God, what can we do for you? Let me call someone, let me call this one. And I was all over City Hall yesterday. It was absolutely astounding how helpful people were and just went out of their way. <laughs> Everybody's so stunned. <laughs> <laughs> Billy, Billy, back. <laughs> so my oldest son just started kindergarten on Monday. Oh, oh man. Exciting. I know. If my wife were here, she'd probably have 20 happy dollars. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah it was pretty exciting dropping them off at school. And I think it just reminds you how fast they grow up. That's So I called up Grandpappy and uh, asked him what was going on. He said, well, I'm uh, performing hydrothermal processes on ceramic, aluminum, and steel under constrained conditions. I said, what? He said, I'm washing dishes and Grandma's looking over my shoulder. <laughs> Most of you guys here know how to do a makeup because you're here and you don't have to do makeups. But when he's done, and I think Power Jim's got a PowerPoint presentation too. Right here. Yeah. It's a PDF document. That's fine. We're gonna, we're gonna be sending that out too for folks who don't know how to sign on. Does everybody know how to just sign on to the website? Well, the raise up. Who doesn't? Raise your hands. Everybody got their password. Everybody's got their user ID. Tell them where their user ID is. Yeah, the password is the user ID. The user ID is the, your email. Well, that's your password, isn't it? Yeah, you've got to create a password. No, but you have it. Yeah, it's a cl your club yeah, number. Yeah, your user ID is actually your email. But we don't have to worry about that because everybody's got it. So uh, <laughs> you go straight into training on how to do a makeup, Steve. Okay, and, th and that being said, if you have a problem logging on, just get with me and let's get you fixed up. I'll come by, I'll swing by and we'll get you logged on one way or the other. Uh, so there really are like three easy ways to do this, but um, matter of fact, I just uh, go into my data and there you will find a picture of me. Right? <laughs> and uh, under here you will see enter makeup. And you put the date of your makeup in, and that, and you submit it, and that's it. As soon as you do that, I get an email that says that you have entered, that you have put in a makeup. And then my job is to go in and, quote, approve the makeup, and then match the makeup to any uh, missed meetings. So all you've got to do is that those two steps in, in your set. So yes. you don't need to put the make the venue where yeah. you made up. Yeah. Oh, I, I and I apologize. Yeah, I apologize. Yeah. I apologize. Down there. yeah. <laughs> it's right. prompted uh, for you. Huh? Follow the prompts. So yeah, all you've got to do, and most people are just putting in uh, watch video or uh, 505. Are you putting the date? 
you're making up, or that they, they well, I, I, make I'm not going to close this out because I'm not really putting it. I, any, I, any, know, I usually put the date I'm making up for. Like I put the date I'm making up. Right. I just put the date of the makeup. Is what you, yeah. you do the date you made the, you did the makeup, right. the makeup right. and then when you put down there makeup venue. It, it's not gonna. It's not a makeup break. It's not gonna end the world either way. The only thing I would warn, I would warn, be very careful because some of you are entering makeups that are beyond the 14 days from the meeting that you missed. So you need to make sure that you're putting in a makeup uh, that is within that 14 day window, because I can't match it. If, if you do it 14 days beyond, I won't be able to match it. Does that make sense? Okay. And everybody I mean, it's not that, that I don't want to match it, it, the system won't allow me to do it. But if we put in two weeks prior and two weeks post meeting to do a makeup. But if we're putting in the date we go to our 505 like yesterday, yeah. Yeah. then we don't worry about it. You just match That's right. It to the That's right. That's it's in there, and since I, I get these things all day, and since I tr I'm trying not to miss anybody, I'm going into the database three or four times a day, and I check it through every time just to make sure I'm not making missing anybody. So you're safe. Unless, unless you're uh, Mr. Pegram, then I'll, then I'll miss you. <laughs> <laughs> One more comment. Does everybody know how to watch a video? I've had people wondering how to do it, and that's probably even easier than the database. <laughs> so everybody knows how to watch a video. Again, this is something that somebody that's not here might not know, but it's the website, meeting video. <laughs> Any other questions anybody has? Anybody? Yeah, well, you're all here, so that's why you don't have to worry about it. You know, uh, well, I would like to say this. I should have done a happy dollar and think about it. I think we had a record for uh, uh, people showing up at a 505 last night. Thank you, Matt, Matthew Foster and uh, Mitch, who's here, for calling us for the moment uh, one at uh, the tap room. We had 13 people show up last night. 14. Yeah, so that was pretty good at 13. I, we may have had a girl in a year or two ago, but I'm not sure. I couldn't tell you exactly where it was. So thanks nice for coming out, y'all. <laughs> okay, our <coughs> speaker today is Valerie Warren. Um, just to give you a little background, I serve on the steering committee for participatory budget in Greensboro. That's uh, a position that city council appoints people to. Uh, 18 people were appointed to it, and it's our job to oversee the entire process being conducted. We're currently in round two of that. And so Valerie is our designated staff person who does this. Valerie supports the development of participatory budgeting processes in the South. She actually works with participatory budgeting project. Um, as a community organizer, facilitator, and strategist with more than two decades of experience, she's been involved in a variety of campaigns and projects to address issues of racial, economic, gender, and environmental justice while building community power. In her, <coughs> excuse me, in her professional life, she has acted as a project manager in a variety of settings, including refugee settlement, supply chain management, purchasing, sales, marketing, and publishing. She has never met a project she wasn't curious about or an issue she didn't want to understand and explore. And when she is not plotting and scheming about making a better world, she loves to spend time with her partner, two kids, and magnificent cats, go for a run, or engage in the fine art of porch sitting with friends. Let's welcome Valerie. Good morning, everybody. Um, can, can you hear me? I, I normally don't need a microphone. so. <laughs> And if I do, then I'll probably blast your ears out. But if, if I'm not loud enough, please just give me a little signal and I'll use the microphone. Um, I like to move around a lot, so uh, I don't do too well with mic stands. 
Thank you so much for the introduction, Wayne. Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, giving me the time to talk a little bit this morning. Like Wayne said, my name is Valerie Warren. I am a community engagement coordinator with the Participatory Budgeting Project. I'm a resident of Greensboro. I've lived here for more than 25 years. And I'm working as a contractor with the city of Greensboro to help implement the second cycle of PB. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my organization and the impacts we found doing participatory budgeting around North America. And then I'm going to talk specifically about the really exciting work that's happening right now with the help of Wayne and other really dedicated volunteers, as well as really excellent city staff to make this pro process available to the residents of Greensboro. So again, thank you so much for your time. So um, like I said, I work for the particip Participatory Budgeting Project. If you can say that well three times fast, you've probably al already had too much coffee, right? It took me about three months to get that to really roll off the tongue. We call it PB, and in, here in Greensboro, we call it uh, Greensboro PB. Um, we're a nonprofit organization founded in 2009. We became an official nonprofit in 2011. Um, our mission is to empower people to make decisions on how to best spend public funds. The principle is that when the people who are most impacted are involved with decision making, that's when we make the best decisions. Um, coming from, as you heard, a variety of backgrounds, I've had that experience reinforced time and time again. Whether it was, actually I worked with Volvo Trucks before now, whether it was making sure we had the right parts um, uh, array for the actual use of the customers, or whether it's here in this process, deciding about the projects that will have the greatest impact, I found it to be true time and time again. So, um, and then again, as an organization, we're based primarily in Brooklyn, New York. We have an office in Oakland, as well as um, my manager is based in Chicago, and I'm based here in Greensboro, North Carolina. So we're all over the United States, and we're actually supporting people who are doing PD all over North America. And now, uh, in the next couple months, we'll be supporting some processes in Australia. <laughs> so, great. So what, what is participatory budgeting? It's a democratic process where people get to directly decide how to use public funds. It's not a representative democratic process. It is a direct democratic process. So, and it can be used in a variety of ways. Uh, in Greensboro, it's used for our municipal budget. We've worked with processes where it's used for community development block grant funds. We've worked with processes where it's used within public school districts, um, it, where they're separate from the municipal funding. We've worked on federal. We've worked in, in um, communities. We've actually worked with some institutions to develop processes for them to use within their organization as well. So when, when people are deciding together, when the funds are accountable, to groups of people, it is a process that can be adapted and scaled accordingly. The basic concept is pretty simple. It's four stages. The first part is you brainstorm ideas. So we had an idea collection phase here in Greensboro. It started in April and it went through the end of May. From then, you develop the proposals from those ideas. You review them for feasibility. You work together with the experts who are involved and responsible for for making the bottom line with regards to implementing those projects to make sure they include all the information they need. So they go from an idea that is submitted in a brainstorming session with residents to a fully fledged costed budget proposal. Um, we're in that process right now. We have about 20 budget delegates who are volunteering across uh, the city of Greensboro working with city staff to develop the ideas that have been submitted. Then after that, people vote. And again, this is direct democratic process. The residents of Greensboro in October and November will get to directly cast their vote for the projects that they think are the most beneficial to their community. The projects that get the most votes win and are funded, and they're actually funded in the next uh, budget cycle of the city. So that's something that's very different. We'll go into that more. And so implementation, again, is the final stage of the process. So it's not consulting. I mean, I'm a consultant. But the process is not consulting. It's actually residents involved in decision making. They took the entire list of more than 300 ideas, 
rack their brains to read it. If they weren't used to spreadsheets, it was a new thing for them. We had these stacks of paper for folks to go through and highlight and review. Then they talked about the fact, uh, they talked about whether or not these were beneficial, what kind of impact they would have, are they feasible, and they're continuing to do research now to, to develop their assessments and to make sure they're correct and to get input to make sure it's the best um, it's the best information possible. So these are actual decisions that are going to determine what the projects look like, and then when people vote, it's going to determine the projects that are implemented. It is an annual cycle. It happens year over year. We're in our second cycle here. Wayne, we're lucky enough, was, was active in both cycles, so he brought his information and knowledge. That means it's a cycle of continuous improvement. So each year, the steering committee uh, evaluates the process, provides feedback for the next process, and they're able to bring the knowledge they learned about what worked, what didn't work, and to make it continually better. That means we're increasing access, we're increasing our communication about it, we're increase, increasing um, our ability to make effective decisions and to make effective use of staff time within the city government as well. So the, the fact that it's an annual cycle is really key because it allows for that ongoing learning. And then it's part of the budget. Right now, it's uh, about one-tenth of the city of Greensboro's budget, or one-tenth of a percent of the city of Greensboro's budget. <laughs> so it's $500,000. Yeah, we're like clutching chest. It's, it's $500,000, which is actually in the smaller end of our, our scale for these processes. We, the, the number of staff who support this process are used in other places to support processes 10 times as large. So there's an economy of scale with the implementation of the process, but it is a significant amount of money. So when we do outreach in the community, we say to people, hey, and, and Wayne's really great at this, we say to people, hey, how would you like to help us decide how to spend $500,000? And that instantly gets people's attention. And then we say, you know, it's $100,000 per district. People have a lot of really brilliant ideas about how that can be used. And it's a, it's a great conversation starter, and it's really meaningful. So our organization, uh, or there's more than 3,000 PV processes around the world. It started in Brazil. Uh, the folks who were the founders of the organization I worked for learned about it there, brought it here. Um, and it's something that has caught on, not just because people want to do something good, but actually because it, it results in, in good relationships and good government. In Brazil, they found that mayors who implement participatory budgeting have a 10% chance of being reelected, which there's almost nothing you can do as an elected official that re results in that kind of an impact on uh, your constituents. Here in North America, it's, it's interesting because the people who come to us who want to implement are typically elected officials. Greensboro is the very first process that came about primarily as the result of community organizing. Um, so it's something that people who are involved in government feel really good about and is really important to them. How many are in North Carolina? Um, just one. Just, just one. Greensboro. Greensboro is the only one in the South. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so there's a lot of places it's being done. And again, we have a network of communication so we can continually improve our processes by sharing that knowledge with each other. And then this is all the different processes in North America. Again, Greenfur is the very first in the South um, with municipal funds. So there was Palo Alto College, which, you know, definitely is the South, but we're the first uh, CY process in the South. So, great. So, yeah, all over. So, I want to talk a little bit more about just the impacts of participatory budgeting. Uh, we're really serious about evaluation, and when we're in a, in a place supporting a process, um, we usually, you know, ask that they or look for there to be third-party evaluation of the process so it's not us evaluating ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. There's people who can give us real feedback about are we doing what we say we're going to do. The first cycle here in Greensboro <laughs> was third-party evaluated by a professor and graduate student at UNCG and that provided a lot of really good insights on to our effectiveness as well as really powerful suggestions. So most of these, these statements come from third-party evaluation, especially a report that's available on our web website, which was assembled by a group called Public Agenda, that uh, aggregated information about the first, first, about the last five years of doing participatory budgeting in North America, looked at every process in North America, 
looked at the results of that process and compiled it into uh, a lot of really effective and useful information. So some of the big impacts of participatory budgeting is broader political participation. That means we're bringing more people into the process who haven't been engaged before. So a lot of people talk about apathy and they get disgusted when they hear voter returns, things like that. This project has been proven in the places that we've done it to bring more people and get them more involved in making decisions. That means there's also more information so that those decisions could be made better. Have you ever gone through a process of working with the committee to plan and plan and plan and plan for months, and the last minute you find something out that throws all that work out the window? I know I have. <laughs> people don't like to admit that, but it's definitely common. This, this, the fact that this brings people into the process means that the decisions are better and that the information that's necessary to make a good decision is involved from the beginning. So we're, we're um, in Vallejo, when they studied that, 20% of the voters were in the process, were not eligible to vote in regular elections, but they were able to give really good insight about the information and the decisions in their community. Um, in New York City, there's a much higher percentage of low-income residents engaged in PB than there are in other civic processes. And I'll get a little bit more. We found some really interesting things about the Greensboro process, which I'll get to when we discuss that. Um, it builds relationships. Most people who participate in PB say that their view of government improves. So that's really poignant right now. There's a lot of very strong feelings about it. What happens during participatory budgeting is that when residents are developing proposals, they meet with the staff of the city, they're able to share their priorities directly with city staff, and the city staff share back to them all of the regulations and processes necessary to implement a program. For example, here in Greensboro, there's a, uh, one of the projects that's being worked on this year is a really beautiful development in the Greenway behind, um, behind Wesley Long Hospital. Well, there's state and federal regulations that have to be met in order for that project to go through. It's not just a simple decision of someone in city government. It's the decision, uh, the city government Workers are experts in knowing how to navigate this. If you're involved in contracting, if you're involved in navigating these requirements, I'm sure you understand the depth of knowledge necessary. Well, that knowledge gets shared with city residents. So they go from, man, I don't understand why it's taking so long. I'm feeling frustrated. I'm losing faith. They don't care. To, I have a working knowledge of this. Not only do I feel like I'm being heard, but I actually can add some ideas about how, how to make it through the process. And that might mean moving it to another place, any kinds of adaptation, and then the residents actually have the chance to do those adaptations that staff don't have, right? Because they have more work than they can ever complete and pressure on city government to operate more efficiently with less resources. Um, it, it develops new community leaders. In a lot of places where participatory budgeting is practiced, nonprofit organizations <coughs> send volunteers to the process to be trained. We're training volunteers in outreach, we're training them in communication. To a certain extent, we're training them in sales because my background in sales ties directly to my background in community organizing where you find out what's important to the person you're reaching out to and you communicate the reasons why what you're talking about might be important to them. It's a value proposition. And they're learning how to facilitate meetings. And then when we're in the proposal development process, they're learning proposal management. They're being set through a process to manage information, to document the research they've done, to consider the, and work with a matrix organization where there are multiple decisions that are necessary and pieces of input necessary to go through. And so our community members come through and they understand the ways the different parts of government interact. They know more about their community and they bring that knowledge back to their communities and make use of it, even if it's not through the PB process, by being able to help their neighbors understand how to get things done. So that's a tremendous level of leadership development. It's a tremendous level of skill development and capacity development as well. It also results in more equitable and effective spending. The example I use when I'm working with budget delegates is I talk about, we're all at a meeting together, right? And, and this is perfect for today. It's first thing in the morning, we've got breakfast, it's, it's part of our process. We have, a, we have an official you know, process where we're, we're serving breakfast to people. 
All right, some of the folks who come to the meeting, they had a really late dinner last night, maybe they were with clients, they're up late, they were able to then get a good rest, go to bed, wake up in the morning, come here. Maybe there's people who are participating who work two jobs. They didn't have time in between the two jobs, so they grabbed a power bar and a monster drink, right? Went from one job to the second job, went home, got a couple hours of sleep, but this important, this meeting is really important to them, and so they come in. So one person is not really that hungry, is actually trying to watch their weight, maybe they just don't want to eat a big breakfast because, you know, they don't want to overdo it. The other person is really hungry, their stomach's growling because they got up and didn't have time to come, they're trying to get as much uh, to sleep as possible, and it's actually a little bit hard for them to pay attention, right? We still spent the same amount of money on food, but the food that was served to the person who wasn't really interested, wasn't really hungry, maybe goes to waste. The food that was served to the person who was hungry and needed a little bit more to eat, it wasn't quite enough, so it didn't even get the job done. That is an example that I use to talk about effectiveness and equity in, in spending. So we're being fair, right? We're serving every person the exact same amount, but the funds aren't necessarily being used effectively because one person doesn't need it so they're wasted, the other person needs more so it's not actually meeting the goals of the, the process, right? So when we talk about equity and spending, we talk about getting the information necessary to know that funds are being used in the most effective way. And the way that proposal uh, delegates are working to do that is they're doing research. They're taking an idea that says, we want to renovate a park in this neighborhood, and they're actually going to the neighborhood and asking the questions, who lives here? Are there children who actually live in the neighborhood? Are there residential areas nearby? Are there other parks that can be used as an alternative? So before they develop the proposal, they're working together to research, does this idea make sense? Not just for the people in the immediate community, but across the entire district. So they're working together to share their research and make sure that as the funds are used, they're used the most effectively possible, and they're making the greatest impact on those that can use it. They're also ensuring that there's access to those, um, to the, the projects that are implemented. So that's, that, that leads to more effective use of public funds. The other piece of that is um, something we've learned in our research around participatory budgeting is that people involved in the process bring more funds to the process. There's an average across all of the PB processes that we've supported in North America that every for every $5 of public funds are spent, there's $1 of additional donations that come in. Because what happens is residents get an idea and they're really excited about it, and they go to the city and they learn the budget limitation for it, or they're looking at a district and they want to advance multiple projects and they don't want to take up all the money for one project, and they'll start looking at things like, oh, hey, this church next door would be help, willing to help and, and actually like clear debris and clean it up. That saves five hours of city employees' time. You know, they may look and say, um, you know, we're actually working with the Cottage Grove Revitalization Project. They, they are pretty organized and they've got access to some grants. So they're looking at what grant funding streams they can use and then what, city, what stuff falls under the city's purview to maximize the resources moving into that community. And they're dedicating a tremendous amount of time, which also represents a valuable resources in making these projects happen. So um, it, that the funding is leveraged by the community engagement in the projects themselves. <coughs> so that's a lot of background, and I, I'm happy to have a time check. So uh, I don't want to run over. I know everyone's got a busy day. But I want to move to the work we've been doing here in Greensboro that's really exciting. Again, we're in the second um, cycle. Uh, we're actually on a different schedule than the first cycle. The first cycle ran, um, it ran uh, winter to spring. This cycle started at the beginning of this calendar year. We'll finish the voting phase by the end of November. And it's actually been a really great time frame. We are hoping it continues in the same time frame year over year. How many um, people on the steering committee? The, the, there were originally 18 people appointed to the steering committee. There's, a, there's been a little bit of attrition in terms of folks moving out of city limits and things like that, but the acting steering committee right now is about 15 people. And they're all appointed by? They're appointed by city council members. It follows the city uh, commission's process where if you go to the city website, there's a standard process for every city commission, and people fill out an application form. It's submitted to the city council, and then they appoint um, they appoint people to serve on the on the steering committee for the process. So, so each year the steering committee does something called writing the rules, 
last year was it was really exhaustive or in the first cycle it was really exhaustive because it was a brand new process and they had to go from the resolution that created PD to the actual inner workings uh, and, and requirements of the city to define how the process would work. This year the steering committee looked at the rules from the first year and evaluated based on what they learned to adapt those rules and also had discovered hey, there's things we didn't even think about. <laughs> like, what if the money ends up not being spent? What happens to it? What, you know, things come up each year, and, and you know, it's, it's a new experience each time, let me tell you. Um, so so the, the goals for the process that were set by the steering committee are the following. The steering committee kind of places the, the process in the context of what they think the priorities of the community, and that may change year over the year, or based on who um, or what they learn. So equity, again, fair distribution of funds, distribution according to need. So it's not always necessarily exactly the same, right? But it's, it's, it's according to a principle that is applied uniformly across the city of addressing issues of need, impact, feasibility, and um, equity. So empowerment, um, just really engaging people and giving them the power to understand how to navigate and operate and get things done in their communities. Um, building community, building leaders, but also building relationships among city and community members. And then finally, transparency. We're really dedicated to making sure the process is transparent so that we understand how the decisions are made, that we understand who engaged in the process, where events took place, whether or not it was fair and, and accessible to as many people as, as as possible. Um, in that first cycle, 1,098 people uh, through conversations during the idea collection process generated 675 ideas. There were 40 budget delegates who worked with city staff to develop 75 proposals. Um, there, during the voting stage, it was 1,123 people and it, our process is accessible to people ages 14 and older who are residents of the city. So it really expands the number of people who can be involved, and it gives much younger people an experience of being engaged with the city. Um, there are 46 total uh, projects on five ballots, and there are 26 winning projects. The update for implementation is this piece of paper, and so if you're curious about the projects that got voted in and where they stand today, Greensboro has actually been um, doing a really great job compared to other cities of getting those projects done really quickly. And it's worth saying that as opposed to other kinds of input processes, actually having a funding stream and a timeline for implementation changes the game tremendously. I'm sure you've been involved in charrettes, planning meetings, things like that hosted by the city. Those are typically taken years before they're funded because a lot of that funding actually comes through bonds. And the bonds are need to be voted in and then they need to be financed in order to be implemented. Will you speak to the bus app? Um, absolutely. So the bus app project was um, one of the projects that came through. It was a, it's an app that can be downloaded onto smartphones that tells people who are waiting for the bus not just when the next bus is expected and how they can find a bus and how to get to where they want to go. It also can give them updates, for example, if a bus breaks down, if it's delayed, things like that. And so that was a proposal that came through the process. Because it was found to equally benefit all districts, it became a citywide proposal. So we are accepting proposals that are specific to a single district. If benefit can be demonstrated and, um, and the, the budget delegates agree that that benefit is equitable across the city, it can be put forth as a, as a citywide proposal, which means it's voted on in each district. In order to be implemented, it would need to receive a winning number of votes in each district. So if it gets a winning number of votes in District 1, but in District 4, it, 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 there are other projects that get the winning numbers of votes, then it won't move through as a final proposal. It won't be implemented. It, sa it says that, completed. That so all five yeah, a lot of those are completed. But I would think that means you have the app. It's yeah, you just have to download the app onto your smartphone. Oh, well, so you can go okay, to the City well, of Greensboro website and download it. Okay, so but it sounded like you said if it gets voted on, but you're saying that was voted, voted on, on. Okay. Yeah. in the first cycle, and the voting is completed. So the list of projects you have are the ones that received winning amounts of votes and are in the process of implementation. Okay. Is that clear? Right. Okay. 
Okay. You mentioned it's $100,000 per district. Mm -hmm. Is that the way the dollars get allocated? So I mean, we, are it being are spent by district? The yes. So so this is so it's $100,000 allocated per district. Right. Now, if say if every district agreed that there was one big project that was $500,000 that benefited everyone in the community, and each uh, district committee made the decision to put that on the ballot, then there could be one big project of $500,000 that everyone would vote for. That's not really how it works. If you look at the if you look at the list of um, projects, most there are a few that are at, at the hundred thousand mark. Most of them are far less than that. So one of the really interesting and powerful things that happens is when they vote, they're not. It's not typically a one-off. You don't just go and vote for one project that takes all of the funding that's available to you. And with the case of a citywide project, it would need twenty thousand dollars from each district. So there would still be $80,000 that could be allocated within that district. And when people vote, they get multiple votes. So they come to us, they look at the ballot, they pick the top three projects that are most important to them, and they cast their votes. So what ends up happening is, um, or and it may be more or less votes based on the total number of projects, so that's just an example. So what, what ends up happening is rather than being an either or or zero sum proposition where it's either yes, this is happening, or no, multiple projects get funded and usually everyone gets at least one project that's important to them. So it allows for more collaboration and more more opportunity for things to get done. Did that answer your question? Okay. Question, if, if sure. your 100000 for your district wasn't spent, say you just had a $20,000 project, mm -hmm. what happens to the other eighty? So what, when we're working with the budget delegates in process, we're actually doing checks. Like right now we're halfway through. <coughs> They submitted the first round of proposals that have been vetted by the city. And so we're actually going through each to try to make sure that there's plenty of projects to be voted on so they don't get into that position. However, according to the rules set by the steering committee, they, the um, individual district committees can make a decision to say, hey, the only thing we really need is this project. I'm looking at this other district's projects and they have some really burning needs that we think are important too. We'd actually like to make a proposal that the funds that are allocated to our district be allocated to a project in another district. That would go on the ballot, and residents would have the chance to vote for it. It would only be implemented if it got a winning number of votes. But, it's, but that is an opportunity. It hasn't happened yet. It's something that was created in the rules. It's an, in, in other places, we actually see that frequently where when you get to the expo stage, which we'll be um, getting to uh, in mid-October, residents see each other's projects, because mostly they're working their own committee, and they actually think to themselves, this is really important to me. It's actually more important. You know, I'm, I'm proposing a flower bed in front of a sign in my neighborhood. This person is proposing a, a crosswalk next to a, a high school in a heavy traffic road. I think that's more important. And so I'm going to cast my vote for that instead of my own. Or midway through when they're meeting and collaborating, they may actually say, I'm looking at the priorities of our community, and we think that's a bigger priority, and we want to support you. So it actually becomes an opportunity where instead of everyone speaking to the city council individually and then stepping away, or everyone fighting for one idea, where they can actually look at each other's ideas, express what they need, but then in a non-defensive way actually decide, I like this. Hey, I can submit it next year. But this is really urgent because this person was hit by a car last year, and, and I think this is a public safety issue, and we need to move it along. So, um, so anyway, great questions. Um, so some of the results that came through, there's a 60-page there's a report from UNCG, there, which is connected on the website. There is a steering committee report that is also connected on the website, if you'd like to go into this in greater depth. But we found that we successfully included representative portion of the city. Clearly, we're not at a, at a huge sample of the city, but we're able to touch with all of the different kinds of folks represent the city. Age groups, um, race, uh, uh, education levels, all those things were represented, uh, were, were accessed in a way that was representative of the proportions that exist in our city. Um, we 70% of the people who were involved in the process had never been engaged in any kind of a civic process before. So that's a huge increase. 
So even though we didn't touch a lot of people in the first cycle, what we did do was we, the people we touched, we brought them into a relationship with the city that had not existed before. So we're really, really proud of that. Um, folks expressed that they were motivated to do more. And they also, we also found that our greatest impact happened when we coordinated with community groups like yourselves. So that's part of why I'm here today. Um, there were an array of suggestions for cycle two. The majority of them were on how to be more effective, with the exception of pro adding programmatic projects. Right now, the process is only around capital improvements. Um, we were not able to add programmatic projects because that would be a decision by the city council. However, in the ideas that are submitted to us, there's a lot of demand for that. So it would be something that folks had found would be really, really interesting. Um, but we've done a lot of work to deepen our relationships, to prove the quality of the project, to clarify roles and responsibilities, and to educate um, about the city itself. The city engagement has been outstanding. They've shown up and made in multiple community events to talk about what they do and to be really transparent to the community. Our timeline, uh, we've completed the steering committee formation and writing the rules. We've completed idea collection. Like I said, we're about halfway through proposal development. If you see on your tables, there's a flyer for our kickoff expo, our poll worker training, and our voting time period. So we'll be kicking that off mid-October. We hope that you can attend if you're interested in learning more. And we definitely hope you can participate in voting. We have the preliminary schedule finalized. It'll be going up on the city website. And information will be moving through city processes and social media um, in the upcoming week. So we're really excited about that. Where does the $500,000 funding come from? It is part of the city of Greensboro. <coughs> so, it was the city, so the city of Greensboro set aside this $500,000 and said, OK, just for, for participatory budgeting pro project, here's your 500 grand. No, they, they set aside $500,000 uh, and said, residents of Greensboro, you decide. And I work with the city to support them to implement the process. So I do things like I help train the steering committee. I help support the leadership of the steering committee to set agendas to facilitate the meeting. I work with the city. And the, the whole idea is that I'm kind of training the city to implement. And that after this year, there will be no further technical assistance. And all of the process will be within the budget department and the other relevant parts of the city of Greensboro. So the residents decide. They are the ones who are identifying the ideas. They're the ones who are developing the proposals. They're the ones who will be voting. I mean, of course, I'm a resident, so I get my votes. But, um, but all I do is support the process. So the city council decided 500,000. Yeah. It might have been 300 or a million. That's right. That's or right. Whatever. And they Correct. That. It was oh. a it was a resolution <laughs> of the city council. Are you an employee of the city? No, I'm not. I'm a contractor, and I work under contract with the city of Greensboro. So, the main point person at the city of Greensboro is, and I'm about to get to that. There we go. Here's your contact information. So that's my contact information up top, my organization. There, the basic email for the process is pbgso at greensboro-nc.gov. The point person is Karen Kixmiller. She is a budget analyst at the city of Greensboro. She's managed by Larry Davis, who is the budget director. And so I coordinate with her to support the process. Once you have it implemented, it's ongoing year to year. That's right. You just move on to yeah, so after next year, I'll still be here in Greensboro being involved as a resident, but I'm no longer going to do implementation with the city of Greensboro, most likely. So. so are these things on a ballot, or is there a small group of people that vote on these? The, they will be on a ballot. The ballot will be available on October 23rd, when our voting time period starts. Yeah. It, it's open to all the residents, so it, it isn't going to be in like your voting place when you go to vote for city council this year, but it'll be all over the city at a variety of places and events, and they'll all be publicly announced. So for example, the public library downtown will have it, or the recreation center near you will have it, or um, we're going to have, like, First Friday downtown will have it. So there's going to be a whole variety of places where people can come and vote basically from October 23rd to November 18th. That's right. There will be, right now, there will be um, a series of city facilitated assemblies where it's an event that will be published that you can go to 
each voting assembly, any resident of the city can vote for their ballot. We'll have all ballots at each voting location, even though they're placed in different districts around the city. And then we'll also be out. What we found is our greatest access comes um, when we when we are out in the community at events that are already planned and we do something called pop-up voting, where we'll have a table with the materials ready and be talking to people about voting. We'll validate the voting you know, by having a you know like ID or whatever shows their proof of address, and then and then they can vote for their ballot. And we learned in our data collection process where we actually doubled our engagements. We we had um, conversations with more than 1,900 people in idea collection. So we're hoping to double our voting access as well. So with with actually half the staff that we have this year. Is the committee up for reappointment every year? By that's right. Members? That's right. So the the um, city council. So December will be the time to submit the. Um, the applications if you'd like to serve on the steering committee. I know I'm at time. I really, really appreciate you all for your time, attention, and excellent questions.